Thank you. I just want to start tonight by actually reading um, out of Ephesians. So if you have a Bible, you can follow along with me. But if not, everything will come, will be in the back, in the beautiful screen that we have. Um, Ephesians 3, verse 14 through 20. And it says this. When I think of all this, I fall to my knees and pray to the Father, the creator of everything in heaven and on earth. And I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully. Then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Now all glory to God who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. I, I've been sitting on this verse for the better part of this year. I just couldn't get it out of my mind and my heart. And um, I guess I'm jumping into the message. Welcome to Flourish. I'm so glad you're here. Um, <laughs> I, you know, my prayer and my desire for tonight is that God would meet you so, so real, so tangibly, that you may experience the love of Christ, as he says. Um, he's the only one that truly makes a difference. I can stand here and be so eloquent, and you can leave here saying, oh, she spoke so nicely, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's when he speaks. When he comes in the room, where he meets us where we're at, that everything changes. And so that is my true prayer and my desire for this night. Now, hopefully, by the scripture that I just read, you have an idea of where we're going. Uh, we're going to be talking about the love of God. Now, I guess I've always functioned under the assumption that knowing... Uh, that Jesus loves me was a basic common knowledge, right? Everybody knows that. Uh, most Bible-believing, church-going Christians have heard that Jesus loves them. You know, maybe you, you had a song uh, sang to you. I've sang it to all my kids, you know. Jesus loves me, this I know. You know it. See? You've heard it. You've heard it. You, we sing about it. We read about it. Um, you know, we emphasize it in some seasons more than others. You know, the single season. And we push it real hard. Jesus loves you. Stay faithful. You know, stay the course. You know, maybe sometimes we also remind people when they're going through an extra hard time or disease hits or difficulty hits. And we tell them, Jesus does, really does love you. <laughs> but this past year, especially for myself, I, I've actually come to face the fact that I did not have a true grasp and a true understanding, um, and maybe even more importantly, a deep experience of the love of God for me. And it's hard to admit because I've been a Christian like my whole life. Christian, you know, I was born in the pew basically, right? So I was in the church and I heard about it and I was familiar with it and I was sung to about it and all the little things and I knew it. I knew it in my brain and my theological brain thought I knew, but my heart and my soul had yet to catch up to this reality. I, did, I wasn't really truly living out this belief. Now, this could be impacted by many different things. Many of us grew up in homes where at times love felt conditional or broken, or maybe it was lacking at times. Maybe you felt that you were loved, but you had to earn the love or be a certain way to receive the love. If you failed or made mistakes, sometimes love was withheld or there was shame placed on you. 
But even those with amazing parents out of a sitcom have ex haven't truly experienced perfect love. Not the kind of love that is transformative for the soul. Jesus' is love. There's an amazing author, um, pastor, um, his name is John Mark Comer, and he actually puts, he says this about this topic. He says, as a general rule, we become more loving by experiencing love. Not by hearing about it in a lecture or reading about it in a book. And then he goes on to, to mention this fact. He says, psychologists' basic rule of thumb is that we are loving to the degree that we have been loved. That might be scary or that might be amazing to you. I don't know. But this is why it's so much easier for those who are well loved by their parents or caregivers in early years to give and receive love as adults. Now, I do want to say that although this might be true, this does not mean that people that come from amazing, loving families don't have a need for an encounter with the love of Jesus. And also that those that come from more dysfunctional families are too far gone to actually be able to be recovered for, and to experience the love of Jesus. The truth for all of us tonight is we are in dire need of his love. A love that is transforming, a love that is healing, a love that is unmatched. There was a 14th century um, writer. <laughs> the name is going to be behind me, I think. So, you know, his name was Callistos something. But that's not important. What's important is what he said. Okay? And he says this. The most important thing that happens between God and the human soul is to love and to be loved. The most important thing that happens between us and God is to know that he loves us and to respond to that love. That's why the verse that we just read at the beginning, this amazing prayer by Paul, is so powerful. He, he recognized this. He knew this. That's why he, he thought about you and he thought about the disciples and he thought about all the people of God. And he fell to his knees and he prayed to the Father. And he said, God, from your glorious unlimited resources, will you empower them? Will you give them the inner strength through your spirit so that Jesus makes his home in their hearts, so that they can trust them, and so that they can be rooted in your love, so that they can remain strong. And may you give them the power to understand the depth, the vastness, the immensity of God's love. And may you experience it. May you experience it though it is too great for you to fully understand. And then what happens? Then you will be made complete. I love that. You will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Paul got it. He had a revelation that, that at the very core of following Jesus and being transformed by Jesus was love. That's it. But not just any love, but the perfect love of God. He is praying for us because he knows that we're going to need it. He knows that you and I are going to need to catch this revelation. It's not easy. We've heard this all our lives, and yet somehow we haven't jumped into the pool yet. We've been trickled, sprinkled, with this knowledge, but we haven't jumped into his love fully. There's so much more. There's a vastness to his love that words cannot describe. And he wants us to experience it. God wants us to experience it. So that our lives will be complete. 
complete. What a word. I don't know about you, but I lived a long part of my life trying to find that thing to make me or make me feel complete. Happy, whole. I did the church thing for a really long time without really understanding what it was about. I've known about God and his word and all the things that we think we need to do. And yet somehow, there was still seemed to be something missing. I don't know if you've ever felt that way. And you know, then we start thinking, okay, well, I'm doing the God thing, and I'm, I'm coming to church, and I've heard about him, so maybe I'm missing something else. And we start asking God and seeking for other things that will maybe make us complete. And God blesses us. He does because he loves us. He gives us people. He gives us friendships. He gives us spouses and children, and he gives us careers and, you know, put whatever is it that you thought was going to complete you in there. But we find out that at the end of the day, the missing piece was nothing, none of those things. We still find ourselves feeling that something else is missing. I'd heard about God's love all my life. But going from knowing about to knowing and experiencing has been a massive leap. One that I'm still taking. I'm still learning. One that is healing and revealing parts of me that I never even realized were broken or hurt. There's levels and depths to his love that we will never fully be able to discover this side of heaven. But it is our privilege that we get to live enjoying it. That we get to live pursuing it. That we get to live sitting in his love. Now, this revelation and transformation can only happen as we look to God, looking at us in love. Just think about that for a moment. As we look to God and you see him looking down at you in love. There's a verse in 2 Corinthians 3, 18. And it says this, and we all who with unveiled faces contemplate, that's a key word here, the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the spirit. It's all about this contemplating. This looking at him as he is and receiving from him His infinite love for us. That's when the transformation begins. That's where the healing begins. That's where life changes. If we're honest, a lot of times we attribute to God things that are not of God. We're not really looking at him as he is, but rather as we imagine him. Or through the filters of our lives, the filters of our upbringing, the filters of our families, the filters of our church backgrounds, maybe even just ourselves, our imagination. When we truly behold him, when we truly contemplate God, what is it that we will see? When we look at his word, what does it tell us about him and his love for us? When we sit before him and simply long to be with him, what is he saying to you? I want to show you just a few verses, because obviously if I showed you all of them, we'd never leave. But just a a few very special ones. 1 John 4, 18 through 19. It says this. There is no fear in love. I love that it says this, dread does not exist. But perfect love drives out fear. 
because fear involves the expectation of divine punishment. So the one who is afraid of God's judgment is not perfected in love, has not grown into a sufficient understanding of God's love. And what does 19 say? We love because he first loved us. I love this. There is no dread, no fear in God's love. We don't have to be like this, you know, like, mm, is he going to hit me now? I messed up. Is it coming? You know, like there's none of that. <laughs> He's not out to get you. He loves you. He loves you. Can you imagine living a life firmly grounded in the truth that you are deeply loved and accepted always, no matter what, by the only one who matters? How would that change your life? If you lived conscious of the fact that God approves of you, that he loves you, that there is nothing to fear from him. How would that change the way you approach him? How would that change the way you pray? How would that change the way that you want to be with him? Jeremiah 31, 3 says this. Oops, sorry, I jumped one. Just kidding. Ephesians 1, 6. Sorry, Joe. To the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. This love is freely given. There's no earning it. There's no deserving it. There's no withholding of it. You are accepted in Jesus. Now we're going to Jeremiah. Jeremiah 31, verse 3. says, Long ago the Lord said to Israel, I have loved you, my people, with an everlasting love. With unfailing love, I have drawn you to myself. You can put your name in there. Long ago, the Lord said to Veronica, I have loved you. With an everlasting, unfailing love. And I drew you to myself. This love doesn't run out. He never runs out. He doesn't leave you. He doesn't get tired of us. He pursues us and he draws us close to him. He wants to be with you. Zephaniah 3, 17. For the Lord your God is living among you. He is a mighty Savior. Look at this. He will take delight in you with gladness. With his love, he will calm all your fears. He will rejoice over you with joyful songs. God delights in you. Can you let that sink in for just a moment? The God of the universe delights in you. God looks at you and he looks at me and his heart is filled with gladness. He smiles. He's not frowning like, oh, these people again. No. He smiles when he looks at you. He's glad that you're in his presence. He's glad that you want to be with him. And he pours out his perfect love over you to bring you peace, to calm your fears, to steady your heart. And not just that, he sings songs over you. He sings, he's so happy and so glad he's singing a song over you. That is amazing. You and I bring joy to the heart of God. Has anybody ever told you that? You bring joy to the heart of God. We usually don't get told things like this. It's usually you need to do this and you need to do that. You need to straighten up, you know. God wants to be with you. 
And that's the thing. Maybe a lot of us have an underlying image or view of God in which we are stepping on eggshells around him. Or maybe when we're nice, he's nice if you behave. Or maybe he's at the ready just to send some lightning down whenever you cross a line. We have images of him. We have things in our hearts and in our minds that we haven't even realized. Until we see this and we go, God rejoices over me? We don't love so that he will love us. We don't do so that he will accept us. He loves and so we are. Everything about the invitation to be with him, this life, this walk is about us truly comprehending and experiencing this. The beauty of this, that God looks at you and me in love, not in anger or frustration or disappointment. And even when we feel like we don't deserve God and we tell ourselves this, if we only looked up and saw him looking at us, then we would see. We would see a heart filled with love and arms stretched wide and him always calling us home. Always calling us to himself. I love this verse in Song of Solomon 7.10. It says this. I and my beloved and his desire is for me. I and my beloved and his desire is for me. His desire is for you. God longs to be with you more than you can ever possibly want to be with him. There's no comparison. We're so easily distracted. We get filled with lesser things. We fill our cup with lesser loves and never satisfy. And we leave him there thinking that all these other things will do. And they don't. But... Even in our brokenness, God is always calling out to us. I had a call with um, my spiritual director a few weeks back. It's, it's a, a, a lady that I talk to. Um, and she, you know, I can be fully open with her and I can talk to her about anything. And she just is there to help me, like guide me to God and help me to listen to the Lord. And so... At, Almost at the end of the call, after we had talked about a lot of stuff, she asked me something. She said, Paula, in, you know that passage in Genesis um, where Adam and Eve had just sinned? They ate from the apple or whatever fruit it was. And they realized that they were naked and they were ashamed. And they were hiding from the Lord, as we would, right? And God comes into the garden looking for them. You know, in the cool of the evening, it says that, you know, they hid, but the Lord was, was there. He came f to find them. And he asks a question. He asks, where are you? And she asked me, how do you hear that voice? How do you hear that question? Is the where are you? Like, hey, where are you? You know? Or is there a kind voice, a loving father actually looking for his children because he wants to comfort them. He wants to find them. He wants to make sure that they're okay. I knew what the right answer was, but I had to be honest because that's what I'm paying for. So I sat there and I told her, <laughs> he's angry. The voice is angry. He's coming because I done messed up. And I'm going to find out, you know. <laughs> and I, I thought, wow, that's, that's what I think about God. Underneath it all. That his voice is angry. Not that he's looking for me to take care of me. But he was looking for them because he loved them. He enjoyed walking with them in the cool of the evening. They weren't just servants to hire to name the trees and take care of animals. No, God loved them. He walked.
walked with them. He wanted to be with them. But we tend to carry the same underlying wrong ideas, so we hide. When we make mistakes, when, when we do things we shouldn't do, what do we do? We, we hide in the bushes like Adam and Eve instead of coming close to the Lord. John Mark Comer, yes, I like him a lot, um, says this about this. He says, I will never forget when my spiritual director advised me, John Mark, sit in your sin and let God love you. He did not mean keep sinning, please, and don't feel guilty. He meant when you sin, as I will and as you will, don't hide it from God. Hold it before God. With no excuses, no blame shifting, no denial, just utter vulnerability. And let God love you as you are. And let God love you into who you have the potential to become. Let him love you as you are. And let him love you into who you have the potential to become. Come to him. Don't hide in the bushes. Don't run away. Don't let it just stay a nice thought in your head. Yes, God loves me. No. Know that he's all in. He's all in. He can handle you. He can handle me. At my worst, he can handle it. Come sit with him, with your broken heart, with your fears, with your unbelief, with your anger, with your sin. Show it to him. And let him love you into the person that you have the potential to become. Don't you want that? Don't you want that kind of love? Don't you want that kind of life? I do. I do. I don't just want to hear about God's love or read about it or discuss it or dissect it. I want to live it. I want to experience it in the depths of my heart. I want it to overtake me, to go into every part of me, the broken, the good, the bad, the ugly. And in this experiencing his love for me in an infinite and unfailing and relentless way. When I'm at my best and I'm my worst. When I think I deserve it and when I think that I don't. It is there, right there, that I catch a glimpse of Jesus looking at me and loving me, knowing everything about me. That I can truly experience what it's like to be truly and perfectly loved. It is that love that heals and changes what we thought was lost and had no more hope of redeeming in our lives. It is that love that leads us to repentance. It is that love that ignites our hearts to love him. So instead of me talking more, I actually want to do something with you. This is a, an exercise that I actually did with um, my spiritual director. And this is called Visio Divina because you have to look at it. Visio from vision, from looking. Um, it's, a, it's an ancient practice of prayer, but being prompted by something that you can see. Usually a painting or nature um, or different things like that. So something visible makes us deepen our connection to the invisible, if you will, which is God. And this way we can receive from him. So I'm going to ask Joanna if she can put this picture up. Um, and I'm going to move out of your way. And for just a moment, before you even start focusing on the picture, would you just take a deep breath in? Just... 
relax. Nothing's going to happen to you. And would you just open yourself up to God in this moment right now? He's here, and he wants to meet with you. So after taking that beautiful deep breath, I just want you to look at it. Just look at the picture for a moment. You need to open your eyes to look at the picture, guys. Just look at the picture and just scan it, take a good look at it. If something jumps out at you, at you maybe focus on that bit. What is God highlighting to you? And if something is jumping out at you or being highlighted to you, just listen to what God is trying to say. Why do you think God is drawing your attention to this? What message is he trying to convey that pertains to your life today? Do you sense an invitation from the Lord? Just allow God to speak into your heart. Receive his love. And now, won't you respond to him? You don't have to say it out loud. It can be right there in your heart. What do you want to say to God in response? What is maybe your prayer? What is maybe stirring in your heart that you want to give a voice to, that emotion? You can talk to him because he's listening. The first time I saw this, I just kept looking at the lamb. It looks so content. Just a smile, right? So happy, so just so delighted to be held by the father. And so I said that to her. I said, well, what sticks out to to me is the lamb. She's content, or he, you know, whatever. He's happy, he's content, he's in God's embrace. How could he not? And then she pointed my direction, and she, my attention, and she said, who else is happy in the picture? Who else is happy in the picture? You can tell me. Who's, who's smiling Jesus is smiling. Jesus is smiling. Yes, the sheep is content to be on the father's chest, feeling his love. But walk away from tonight knowing that God is smiling. That he delights over you. That his love for you knows no bounds. That he's doing this when he looks at you. That when you draw into his presence, he's not burdened by you. He's not stressed out by you. He's not tired of you. He delights in you. And there's no earning of that love. There's no nothing that you can do to make it better or to make it worse. It just is. He loves you. He loves you. And so I'm, I'm going to call the worship team up. You guys can just start playing gently. But I'm going to read the opening verse one more time. You can leave this up if you want. And I'm just going to pray that verse over you. <laughs> over us. And 
and it says this. When I think of all of this, I fall to my knees and I pray to the Father, the creator of everything in heaven and on earth. And I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources, he will empower you, ladies, with inner strength through his spirit. So then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. I pray that your roots will grow down deep into God's love and may it keep you strong. And I pray that you would have the power to understand as all of God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. And I pray that you may experience the love of Christ that it doesn't just stay in your mind, that it doesn't just stay knowledge, but that you may experience his embrace even here and now. That you may feel his face smiling over you. That you may feel his arms surrounding you and saying, I love you now and forever. Even though our brains cannot fully wrap, we can't wrap them around this, but it doesn't matter because we can experience his love. And I pray that as you do, as you experience the love of Christ, that you will be made complete. That God would go into the spaces in your heart that are broken into the spaces that are hurting, into the shame, into the things that you're hiding from others and even from God himself, and that you would let him love you. Won't you let him love you tonight? All we have to do is receive. Just come to the Father and just say, here I am with all of it, all of it, Jesus. I just want to receive. I want this fullness of life, this power that comes from God. And I know, Jesus, that you are at work within us. And you're capable of more than we could ever ask or think. But you know, there's an invitation on the table tonight. There's a few invitations. That little sheep belongs to that shepherd. If you're here tonight and he is not your shepherd, if he is not your Lord, he wants you to be. He wants you to be his little sheep. He wants you to belong to him because these promises and these beautiful invitations are for those who belong to Jesus. If you're here and you haven't given your heart over to the Lord, he's calling you. He's calling you home into his arms. So I'm going to pray a prayer. And if that's you, I invite you to pray with me and receive God's invitation for forgiveness, for new life, for love like you've never known before. So if that's you, you can pray this prayer with me. Jesus, I'm coming to you today. I pray that you would forgive me from my sins. I don't want to live away from you any longer. I want to be like that sheep. I want to follow you wherever you lead me. And I want to belong to you for the rest of my life receive your free gift of salvation and I give my life to you in Jesus name Amen and the other invitation is for all of us to receive his love tonight as we sing this one last song won't you just open your heart to Jesus receive his love pouring out on you and just enjoy it. Enjoy that he loves you tonight. You can stand or you can sit. That's up to you.
lost to yourself, Lord. Would you give us the capacity, the understanding to know, to understand, to experience this love and its vastness in our lives? Would you help us to not run away from you? help us to surrender to you? Would you help us to come contemplate your beautiful face looking down at us with love? Would you help us to make the space in our lives for that? To stop every day to look up to you. To spend time with you allow you to love us, to pour into us, and may you expand our hearts with that love, and may you bring us into this fullness of life that you have for each one in this room. Bless them, Lord, I pray. Empower them, strengthen them, root them and ground them in you, and may they feel every day like that sheep the shepherd's chest. And may they be reminded that you smile on them and that you love them. We thank you for tonight. We thank you for your love. We thank you for you. We thank you for you.